Yes. So my question that I just asked is because there is indeed a huge amount of confusion on, on this topic. And I typically think of what people here have been calling noise, and, and you'll hear it being called noise, is uh, actually just another stimulus. And what, once you start thinking of it that way, uh, I'll, many of the confusions will, will be clarified. Okay, so one of the neat things about this topic is that there are lots of controversies um, that we'll be having already. And controversies are nice because they can be solved if the adversaries get together and talk, and that's the kind of thing that we're doing in this session. Well, I have a kind of a large list of things that I want to cover. One of the main themes that I'll be coming back to again and again is that the use of this noise mask can be very useful for connecting what we do, which is psychophysics, that's what most of us are doing here, to physiology. And that used to be a very popular thing. How, how, I'm just curious, how many people here are familiar with this, and, and in, especially like the title of this Campbell Robs, Campbell, Blake, Blakemore Campbell paper. How many people are familiar with Blakemore Campbell? How many people are not? Okay, it's about 50-50. Um, so I'm going to introduce this uh, topic, and Whitman yesterday uh, made a big deal about the good old days with Blakemore Campbell. Um, one of the controversial things is that it has been claimed that there is a singularity, a mathematical singularity, in distinguishing the effect of whether something is threshold elevations are due to noise or are threshold elevations due to gain control. So that is a controversy that uh, I'll have a focus on. One of the ways of finding out if there's a gain control is just to look at it and does it appear, does, it sit, does the external noise or mass change the appearance of the test pattern? And, um, and that's going to be controversial about even how do we uh, talk about how do we measure appearance. Um, and there's a wonderful new approach to this, a whole new way of looking at the last 50 years of vision research. Um, Instead of the, and, and, and Whitman made a big deal of that yesterday, so I'm going to focus on, on that, and we might get to the Guinness record. Um, there's a possibility that the 2AFC methodology that is so popular has serious flaws for studying noise. Nahmi has uh, talked about that, and that will be kind of my conclusion. Uh, and also, the possibility of one way to deal with controversies is to get people together and talk to each other. So if there's nothing else that gets accomplished, maybe something like this will happen. Um, and then I'll end, I'll definitely uh, talk about future guidelines, um, some, some my little ideas. And since there's not gonna be enough time, I did discover in our little pamphlet on page six that all of these things, that all the slides will be on some repository. So if I go too fast, um, uh, you can see it there. Okay, well, the Blakemore Campbell was titled on the existence of neurons in the human visual system. It was published in the Journal of Physiology. So this was an audacious idea that one can use psychophysics to learn about the brain. And I was, I'm still a believer in that, and it is complicated, but that's what our project is. So let me talk a little bit more about Blakemore and Campbell's paper. And I want to give my naive opinion that I think there's a difference between Europe and the United States. And one of the signs, at least for our community, is that I, am, I have this feeling that this connection between psychophysics and its giving insights into what's going on inside the, the mechanisms of what's going on in the brain is I'm seeing it more here at, ES, at the ECBP than, say, at BSS. So thank you, thank you, and I'm probably going to be coming back here uh, more often in the future. Okay, well, this is the Blakemore Campbell picture. Uh, on the horizontal axis is a uh, spatial frequency, and they uh, adapt this one. Uh, Fergus Campbell adapts to a 10 cycle per degree rating, and then you measure again the visibility of the test pattern, and this is the threshold elevation. So this is a very famous uh, curve. It, you'll see it's steeper a little bit on the high side. 
Um, and so this is a, a curve, and, and uh, so the idea was that uh, this is very similar to the curve that when you do the same thing on neurons, you'll get a curve that looks very, something very similar to this. However, uh, in, in 74, a few years ago, um, uh, Stromer and I pointed out that to connect the adaptation curve to the cycle, the cyclophysics adaptation curve to neurons, you have to actually do a right-left reversal uh, for th this one. Uh, this, this, is, this one is here, but th what the um, actual uh, connection to physiology is this one. And so there's controversy number one. How do you connect the blakemore campbell curve to the neurons? And it's flipped, and why is that, and what do we, uh, what, what is going on? And can one have a new way of connecting psychophysics to, um, to the uh, underlying neural structure? The other thing that blakemore campbell did, and this is now going to be a theme of my thing, is that they also not only did, uh, adapted to a sine wave, the previous slide, and that, that was this, this curve here, that adapted to a sine wave, they also adapted to a square wave. Now, the people who know Fourier know that a square wave has got a fundamental and a third harmonic, and, for, and, and, um, and they um, got an extra adaptation just where the third harmonic is. Does anybody see a flaw? Anybody see a flaw in this slide? Okay, well, I'll tell you the flaw. It's that Fergus was his own subject, and he used a method of adjustments. So they, 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 they just changed the knob until they couldn't see it. And then when people started replicating it, um, this, the first ones were Nachmius, uh, Nachmius uh, uh, in, in 73, uh, was unable to replicate it. And they started then taking this thing, and this is going to be my theme, from audition, something called sequel detection theory, to AFC, or doing blanks, and you know, always measuring blank, and anyway. Uh, when they started doing this with sequel detection theory, this disappeared, Th this extra threshold elevation disappeared, and you got, uh, there was no adaptation to the third harmonic. Uh, something else was going on. And so this was the beginning of abandoning method constant stimuli and using much more careful methods, and that's going to be one of the themes of, of my paper, uh, of this talk is that one has to be very careful when doing certain kinds of psychophysics. And Michael Morgan said, pointed out, that was two days ago, that even when using civil attention theory, if you're not very careful, you can get these criterion effects, uh, even in civil attention theory, mis misused. Okay, so now we're back to the main theme, which is, um, this is now, I'm just reading from the abstract. Uh, so, some of the controversies uh, was how did you distinguish multiplicative noise from contrast gain control? So what I have in mind here, and this is, uh, you'll see this again, uh, on the horizontal axis is the pedestal contrast. No noise right now. You can change the pedestal and then you're measuring how much of an extra test pattern do I have to add to get a D prime of one. And, and then here's a little bit of it, something called a dipper function. This is the detection threshold and there's a little bit of facilitation with the pedestal. And then this is the part of the thing where there's a major controversy and we don't even have an explanation of why does the threshold raise. One is it could be a contrast gain control, a nonlinearity of something called a transducer function. Uh, the other possibility is that it could be something called multiplicative noise, that this pedestal or external noise is adding to the noise, something called multiplicative noise. And so which one is it? Uh, well, we can do, try to do experiments. Uh, it's either multiplicative noise or is it gain control or is it multiplicative or whatever, so one can try to do some experiments on that. And we have to, so now here's my big black box. So here's what I just talked to you about, the test and the pedestal, uh, and they, they just sum it uh, physically. You just add on the computer screen, you, the test and the pedestal are just added together. Here's what was formed of what everybody else is calling external noise and what I'm calling the mass, that's why I asked my question over there. Uh, then there's something complicated that comes in. There could be some real noise. This is neural noise inside the brain, either at the input or maybe in the middle, or uh, the Dosher Dosher Lu people put it uh, somewhere uh, come kind of at the end. Uh, something very complicated, then you make a decision, and there could be the history, that very, very complicated kind of stuff. Um, 
the uh, and I'll point out that there is going to be a way of doing this. And the most important little item on this picture is that the output of this black box is an analog number. And we have an analog feeling. Every time I look at a computer screen, I have an analog feeling. It's not a binary, yes, no, first interval, second interval. Uh, I have a feeling of that kind of analog. And so what Nahmi has introduced, which is going to be the solution to many of the controversies, is to, since it's an analog feel that one has, why not use more than one button, a rating? So that's kind of the ending of... Uh, uh, and then this guy, Baker, has this something invented. At first I was laughing, I thought it was weird. He calls it zero-dimensional noise. And what he's taking is calling is some... The thing that I have been calling a pedestal, he's calling that a, no, a noise. Instead of calling it a mass, he's putting it in this, a piece of it in this box, only get zero dimensional. And at first I thought that was one of the silliest things I ever heard, but I think now it's one of the most brilliant strategies. Uh, so thank you. I have totally flipped. Very, very thank you. Uh, and so, uh, okay, that's what I just said here. Uh, the next two slides I'm just going to I was at first going to talk a lot about them, but um, uh, this is my co authors uh, that's uh, uh, Levi and, and Jean Ding. Um, have a game control model with no noise, and it is not just a game control model, but when you are serious and carefully examine uh, appearance with no noise, but just what does it look like, you find, and this is now binocular interactions, you find that things are already complicated. It's not just a simple game control, here, but it's a game control of a game control uh, where you get two denominators. Um, so, so this is an approach that you can explain everything just in terms of nonlinearities, and then the noise comes at the very end. The other theory that's on the opposite, the very opposite side that explains everything, is uh, Dosher Lu, Lu Dosher, uh, where they have at first just a, a nonlinearity, but then that non that's quadratic, and that goes through the system forever. It never changes. No, no change of the no, no, no gain control. In the but then no multiplicative noise. And here, I, I just want to include this Ludosher slide. Here is on the horizontal axis is different changing the different amounts of external mass or external noise, and on the vertical axis is changing the signal. And over here it looks like it looks like as the noise goes, the appearance disappears. And so you can say that there's gain control, but it might just be that there's masking. Anyway, it's it's very complicated, even with appearance uh, disappearing. It, it's very hard to separate out these things. Now we come, I'm getting close actually to the main, this is now the, okay, so I'm going to go, this is now just copying from Baker that there's, uh, there's various things, it was already, already mentioned these kinds of things. And so there's these four, and now I'm just adding, now comes the most important part, I'm adding this one extra, a fifth thing that you should do that not me is, um, oh, oh, another thing, this is now the model fest slide. I'm just taking the same paper, uh, and anyway, this is the, the same uh, from paper. Uh, and these, uh, there's something, this is all the different pictures of what is the slope of the psychometric function in noise, in the external noise, and the slope it out. The Deleuze Dosher say that it all is the same, or have, have the same slope, so they, they find data here. Everybody, a lot, a lot of other people find, this is us, find data that there's a difference between whether you're doing it on a blind with noise or without a noise. And so, what is going on? What, what is in the methodology something that's going on? We think it's uh, uncertainty is what's going on. So now comes the, maybe the most important part of, of my talk, which is what not for me is in 1970, long forgotten suggested, which is to do all experiments, even just of a blank and a signal, just two things, but give a rating, give, give four buttons, interrogate yourself, did I have a feeling that it was very visible or just a little bit visible? And so give four buttons, not just two buttons, and then you can do something called the ROC slope. 
uh, something on the single tension theory, there's an ROC curve, and the slope of that tells you how much multiplicative noise there is. So every time anybody does any experiment, give multiple ratings, you have to convert it to AFC to a one AFC, um, and, and uh, this different from, oh yeah, anyway, so this, it's, it's just, you can do it with three stimuli, anyway, read the 1970 Nakamiya's and Kosher paper, it's having three, one, two, three stimuli, well he did with two, but I, I think three is better, and then one, two, three, four buttons, there's three criteria. And from that you get the ROC curve. And now this is uh, some thoughts on the model fest, uh, the, um, you can, um, by getting people to talk to each other and using a methodology that's uh, improved, uh, I'm confident that the answers will, will be um, forthcoming, that we can resolve some of the controversies. So now is, this is my last, uh, this is now my guidelines for future experiments. One is, I, I had to mention it, but uh, you can change this external mass, I, I don't know why I'm calling it noise, you can change the mass to uh, do whatever you want, and my suggestion is to remove the amount of the mass that's in the pedestal, because inside that, what people call noise, there's a little fraction of that noise that is just the pedestal, so remove that part, and that now, and I'm, when you remove that, I'm calling it the notch, <laughs> and put that into the stimulus, because that pedestal is the thing that you're looking for, and so the, so use notch noise, uh, and so it'll, it'll put the pedestal, part of the notch noise, into the pedestal, and then, also follow Nachmius's time order effect. This is now the 2007 paper, 2006 paper, which is to modify the 2AFC. In order to do the ratings, you can't do 2AFC. So always, you, you, you can make it look like to the subject like it's 2 AF, two alternatives, but always put the reference in the first interval. And then the second interval, so look at the reference and then make your judgment on the second interval. And just to keep them honest, to make sure that they look at the reference, Change the amount of pedestal, this amount of zero dimensional thing. Change, change that pedestal. Don't call it noise, but keep track of did you add the pedestal or not. So you have to pay attention to the, that interval. That's number two, follow his advice. Uh, and then you can do Baker's thing of intermixing all of the double pass, the twin noise, the full D prime slope, not just the slope, but the full D prime function, and uh, the matching, do a, do a matching thing, the appearance thing, and, and follow uh, what, what Michael Morgan uh, said about that. Um, and also add this other thing of the nominous culture, the 1970 thing, of using ratings, so you can get the ROC slope, so you can actually measure the internal noise. And uh, then, and Michael's advice on Monday, I guess, uh, was to intermix various conditions that look alike. Don't intermix a blank, a zero mask with a mask with things that look alike. And uh, as a special bonus, you can do a much jo better job on classification images, because uh, if you do two AFC with classification images, everything gets messed up. So. Of this one AFC task is much better. Um, and so then I'm, I think I've run out of time. Yeah, so here I'm just showing when you go to the um, record when on, on the repository, you'll, you'll see uh, many other things. Anyway, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have got one minute. Uh, perhaps we have time for one very quick question while Josh is. Stop you earlier, but you were saying nice things about me, so. <laughs> <laughs>